part one. This is the island of Singapore. I'm from Singapore. Um, I grew up in Singapore. Um, but actually, I wasn't born in Singapore. I was born in a small, sleepy village, uh, fishing village called Moa, which is located on the west coast of Peninsular Malaysia, about two hours from Singapore. I was born in 1977. Um, I fall into a very common category that a lot of Malaysians and Singaporeans are actually a part of, whether they want to openly, ad openly admit it or not. I have friends who would actually rather die than admit that they are half Malaysian or half Singaporean. And um, having a set of parents from two currently extremely different countries, which was in fact one country before August uh, 9th, 1965, um, actually, for a very long time, there has been a certain level of porousness that permeates the region, um, you know, with goods, people, ideas, cuisines, uh, moving extremely fluidly, not only between Malaysia and Singapore, but also between the isl islands of Bintan and Batam, which are islands belonging to Indonesia. So this idea that Singapore is a standalone Asian miracle is actually a, a very new thing and uh, a very good story in our globalized, you know, clean corporate world. Uh, Singapore, as you might know, is the only country in the world that uh, has gained independence from another country without a revolution or a war. It was simply rejected and then subsequently ejected from Malaysia. Uh, this is a very long story to get into, so I'll save it for next year's lecture. <laughs> Uh, to get to, a, to the point, because of this one separation event from the moment of my birth, I have been subjected to three laws governing citizenship in Singapore. The first, uh, this, which basically means that I would remain Malaysian because my dad's Malaysian, even if I'm my mom's Singaporean, so it's like totally sexist, you know. Um, the second, um, this means that I can become a registered resident of Singapore, but only as a guest and I have to retain my Malaysian citizenship. My father, like myself, uh, we became permanent residents, that's what we call it in Singapore. And this, uh, which is crazy, that I need to uh, serve for two and a half years in the military, um, and then only upon the completion of this, I can renounce my Malaysian citizenship and bestow uh, Singapore citizenship. So, in a nutshell, I was militarized against the country I was born in. And we can, you know, in today's context, I think we can see very clearly that Singapore's sovereignty as a country is constructed on the retelling and telling of the stories of our neighbors as lesser or dirty or unsuccessful or backward or not Asian enough or too Western. This is, of course, um, cultural warfare that we have learned from the Cold War, and we are very, very good at it. Part two. This is a door. This is another door. And another door. Uh, for a couple of months now, I've been walking around different cities in the, around the world in search of embassies. But rather than this view, I would be attempting to collect this view, this unheroic, neglected, silent view. Um, it's kind of the part that no one wants you to know about because, you know, it's the back door. Um, I think we can all agree that nationalism is a kind of fiction and a way of telling a story that produces a kind of agreement about what is real and what is not. Just like money or the law, these are things that allow us as human beings to somehow agree with each other on a scale that um, allows us to cooperate and to interact with each other uh, to more or less dominate the planet, right? Um, so a lot of my work actually involves around looking at and thinking about uh, infrastructure. What is infrastructure? Infrastructure uh, often points to the, the overt point of contact and access where the underlying rules of the world can be clasped in the space of the everyday life. Infrastructure points to the things which are invisible, things that need to move, work smoothly, 
without a, a glitch. And within this framework, my practice, my entanglements with uh, fiction writing, organizing vis visual structures, and collecting ideas and observations, uh, I kind of see this as testing the limits of infrastructure and, and also revealing the hidden power structures behind it. So, um, you know, standing on the street, looking at these, the, the borders of this architecture marked as another country. I often feel excluded, and in this moment, I'm, I'm very curious about the kind of slippages that would allow me entry into these territories. I am looking at a back door into a system. A country is a system. Systems are coded by a person or a group of persons. Um, these back doors, uh, you know, are very well hidden most of the time, except for this one. I really like this one. It's uh, terribly designed. <laughs> you know immediately that it leads somewhere, and it's not. A <laughs> you know, whoever designed this, uh, this embassy should be fired, you know? <laughs> really, seriously. Um, so I have more or less photographed about like 300 back doors of embassies, and I'll just keep on going, I think, and uh, it's the kind of project that is endless until it finishes, you know. Um, I'm also including buildings that were previously inhabited by embassies, like this one, which is the American Embassy in The Hague, the, the old one, you know, which was, you know, has been there forever, and it was such a, a stronghold and a, a point of contact in the Cold War. Um, but on other than that, uh, unless it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a building that the embassy has moved out on, I will not reveal which back door leads to which embassy because I'm not an investigative journalist and I'm not interested in the literal expose of back doors. <laughs> um, I'm also actually openly admitting that I might be wrong about <laughs> some of these back doors <laughs> and they might not be back doors. <laughs> For example, I took a photo of this, and my friend who was working in this embassy said, dude, it's like the storage room, you know? <laughs> and uh, actually, a lot of my work also deals with like, the idea that there's, there's just this whole state of unknowing, and that, you know, like as human beings, we want to know everything, but it's totally impossible. It's also ridiculous. Um, so what I'm trying to say is I don't deal with hard fact, I deal with fiction. And uh, I think with this project, I'm also like writing fiction. Um, so the way I want to show it is like this. I just want to kind of repeat them on surfaces, like you know, old school Windows 95 desktop patterns. They kind of resemble like footage from like a surveillance camera that I'm trying to place like the viewer of the work in the position which is similar to the embassy looking at the doors. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And um, I, th I think I'll just like print them on everything, like canvases or prints or like wrap Christmas wrapping paper and curtains and mugs and T-shirts and, you know, like everything, you know? Postcards, socks, socks, uh, bus seats. Uh, I want these secrets, these things in politics that are unsaid, invisible and sinister to be on everything. Part three. I just want to end with a sentence the Malaysian artist Riza Piyadasa wrote on the sculpture in 1977, the year I was born. It is a sentence that has influenced my work greatly over the years. Oh, where is it? Oh, this one. He wrote, a fact has no appearance. Thank you. <laughs>